but in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now today we're, we've come to a session on the tame tongue and the transformed life. The tame tongue and the transformed life. So as we look at this topic, before we even go into the references, we begin to ponder on what is the relationship between the tongue and the life. A, a tongue, as your tongue has the power to transform your life. If you transform your words, it's going to lead to a transformed life. But also the Bible tells us that the tongue itself can no man tame, can no man transform with their own power. So a transformed life will also lead to a tame tongue. So the outcome of today, or the aim of today, is that not that we just get knowledge, but we want to get a transform, a tame tongue that will also transform our life. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And when God made us, he made us in his own image. As you look at God, the way God is, with his own words, he created. He created things that were not existed with, just by his words. And he has given us that power also. By our words, we can create a better future for ourselves. By our words, we can create victory for ourselves. But on the downside of it, there's also death. There's also destruction in the tongue. So if there's any way we have been misusing our tongues, either through self-talk, the things we say to ourselves and about ourselves, or even the things we say to our children about our children, to our husbands, to our wife about our husbands and our wives, about our situation. God is calling us today to change. Is there any bondage that pe people are in that can be traced, or any affliction that can be traced back to the use of their tongue? And no matter how many people pray on that situation, if the person is still continuing to use their tongue that way, then will things actually change? Let's open our Bibles as we go through some cogent references on the tongue. Let's see Proverbs chapter um, 18, verse 21. Proverbs chapter 18, and we'll be looking at verse 21. I'll read from here. Proverbs chapter 18, and verse 21. He said, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, or the tongue has the power of death and life. And they that love it shall eat the food thereof. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. In the book of James, James chapter 3, James chapter 3, I'll be reading from verse 1 downwards. James chapter 3, verse 1, brethren, My brethren, be not many masters, or be not many teachers. Don't haste to run to the pulpit. Don't haste to say, when it is my turn, are they going to make me a teacher? Are they going to make me a preacher? Are they going to make me somebody that use my tongue in public ministry, a chorister, a communicator? James' advice says that be not many masters, be not many teachers, be not many instructors knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. What is he saying here? As we have, God has given us the privilege to use our tongue in public ministry, or even in private ministry, maybe at home, giving us that uh, a platform to use our tongue over our children, over our husband. He says that to whom much is given, much shall be expected, knowing that we are going to receive the stricter judgment. Because God has given us that platform, also, the judgment we are going to have is going to be a stricter judgment, which is called a greater condemnation. You say, Pastor, why is that? Because as a normal person, just a person, a man on the street, a brother or sister in the church, we are still going to be judged on our words. 
But when we also have that platform, you are going to have a double judgment on those words. The one you said privately, just in your normal interaction, and then the one you said publicly. And then the one you said publicly might be good, might be nice. And then you now go and spoil it privately. You preach and then you go and gossip. And God is saying, those things, is that's not consistent. Can good water, uh, sweet water and bitter water come out of the same place? The song you sing, praising the Lord and encouraging us to worship the Lord as a chorister, and then you go and misuse your mouth on Monday to Friday in the office, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation or the stricter judgment. In verse 2, for many things we offend all. In the multitude of words, they want to not sing. The average person speaks maybe 25,000, 30,000 words, because you, you speak more, then you have more more opportunity to offend. In many things, teachers offend many people. In many things, pastors might offend many people. And people that use their mouth as masters offend many people. It says, if any man offend not in war, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body, which is saying that the last frontier of uh, discipline is the tongue. What do I mean by that? It means that when you are born again, you have bridled your appetites, you bridle your flesh, you bridle the places, your feet, the places you go to. You have controlled everything. The, the hardest, and probably the last one, is the tongue. Is the toughest one to control. And that's what James is going to tell us in verse 3. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths. When your people want to ride a horse, there's a little thing they put in the mouth. It's called a bit. It's a sharp object. And if they want the horse to stop, they just pull on the bridle and the bit cuts into the mouth. It bites into the mouth of the horse and the horse knows to stop. If they want to turn the horse likewise, that's how they control the horse through the bit. They put in the mouth. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouth that they may obey us, and we may turn their whole about their whole body. Big horse, bigger than us, but small thing we put in the mouth, we can use it to control that thing. In verse 4, another illustration here, behold also the ships, which though they be so great, are driven and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are torn about with a very small hand with us, however, the government listed. So the person controlling the ship, small part, the helm, he uses it to turn a ship. Have you ever wondered how a ship can turn? How a big ship can turn in the sea? It is true, this thing they call the helm. And this two, these two illustrations in verse 3 and 4, he's driving a point. In verse 5, he says, even so. The same way as a bit in the horse's mouth, and the same way as the helm of the ship, even so the tongue is a little member, a little part of the body, very small, but it boasted great things. It can do big things. Behold, how great a little, how great a matter a little fire can let. Another illustration coming in here. A little fire can cause a big damage. In the dry season, you hear of our forest fires. Somebody just threw a match down when everything is dry and the whole place burns up. A little fire can cause a problem, can burn down a house, a little match. All what we are reading about here is little things that can cause big damage. And what is that little thing, my brethren? That little thing is your tongue. It's my tongue can cause big damage. My sister in your family, the big trouble we are seeing is it caused by that little object in your mouth. My brother, the, the problem we are seeing is it caused by your tongue. Your children, you say, please pray for my children. My children are becoming rebellious. My children are becoming, they don't want to listen to me. They are becoming discouraged. Can we trace it back to your tongue? The things that are happening in your life, is it something you've even said about yourself? Self-fulfilling prophecy. Brother, let's take caution. 
In verse 6, even, and the tongue is a, as a fire, it's a world of iniquity. Inside that tongue, if you unpack it, there's a whole world packed into that little member of your body. And so is the tongue among our members, it defiled, that it defiled the whole body and set it on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. It's not from heaven. So people that have sharp tongue, they say, it is God that blessed me with this sharp tongue. I just say it as it is, and your tongue can cut like a razor blade. And I say, it is the gift of God. No, it is the fire of hell. It is Satan that is that gave you that gift. You need to really take it to God so that God can take it away from you. That gift of talking and cutting with your tongue. And you know, life has gone advanced. Some people nowadays, they say, they will read this and they will say, hmm, I don't say it out with my mouth. But you know what? Some people, the, 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 the weapon of choice is not the tongue. It is the phone. The same word that they used to say out of their mouth in the olden days before phone, now it is now by SMS, by WhatsApp. So people, when you receive the WhatsApp from them, it is full of venomous poison. They say, well, I did not say it with my mouth. It's still the same thing. It's still the same thing. Technology has now given you an extension of your tongue that you can use to pierce, or you can use to set on fire, you can use to cut into pieces. In verse 7, for every kind of beast and of birds and of serpent and of the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. The Bible says that nobody can tame their tongue. One day, it will come out. Some people say, well, because of education and culture and discipline, I know how to, but one day somebody will step on your toe, out of the abundance of the heart, heart the mouth will speak. No man can truly tame the tongue. It is a really evil, full of deadly poison. If the Bible is saying this to us, as it is saying, we need to take it very seriously. It is full of deadly poison. It is an unruly evil. You know what that means, my brethren? An evil that cannot be controlled, unruly evil. Where is it? It's in your mouth. It's, it's hiding there in your mouth. In verse 9, wherewith, with the tongue, we bless God, or even the Father, and with the tongue, we curse men. That's the inconsistency. On Sunday, or with the tongue, we sing, we bless, we preach, and then with the same thing, we curse men, we gossip, we tear people down. When we're angry, we say some poisonous words to people that made them feel like committing suicide. which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a fountain send forth at the same place bitter, a sweet water and bitter? Or can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Either a vine fix, so can no fountain yield salt water and fresh. You have to make a choice. You cannot say both will be coming out of the same mouth. By our words, we are going to be justified, and by our words, we are going to be condemned. This is, a, this is a serious reminder for all of us. Our words are very, very important. If you are going to a point in your life where you are becoming careless with your words, and people do become careless after many years in a, in a situation. That's my, you see, many, word, many years in unemployment, then the mouth becomes loose. After many years, even with the faith in the church, then the mouth begins to become loose with the tongue begins to become loose with time. Loose out with time. The things we could not say when we just came in, we, we can say them freely now. After many days in this country where we are, oh, our tongues are becoming looser. After many days in a marriage relationship, our tongues are becoming looser. We no longer respect the other person. Because we are over familiar and we can say anything. We say, well, it's my husband, it's my wife. He will take it from me as I am. It is you cannot say the office, my sister. You cannot even say it as everybody says, sister is so so nice. She's so so soft spoken. You can say it at home. Why? Because when you come home, you relax. When you come home, you say, I don't need to impress anybody. When we come home, you say we have all, it's for better for worse. He cannot throw me anywhere. So no matter what I say. And the things we cannot say to outsider, we say to inside. Is that good? Shouldn't we even be better with insiders? 
should be better with the people that God has said, take care of this one for life. No, the reverse is because out of over familiarity, we do not consider the effect that our words are having on the other person. We want to break this into three subheadings. The first one are the traits of an evil, cause provoking, and damning tongue. What are the traits? If we see these things, it means we need to take our tongue back to Calvary. And then the second is the trace of a good blessing, attracting and impacting tongue. There's a tongue that attracts blessing. Remember that woman who had a big problem, big challenge in her life. And just her words brought her the deliverance. Her name is Anna. When that man misunderstood her, it was painful. But the words she said attracted blessing. Remember the other one, Abigail. The words, her words attracted blessing that she, in the case where she, uh, the whole, her whole household, her husband should have been destroyed. And point number three is taming and mortifying an unruly tongue. How do you tame that tongue? All of us need to know that one. So what are the traits of an evil, cause-provoking and damning tongue? We've read Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, and we've read um, James, we've read the book of James as well. Now, let's run through a, some of this list, uh, a list here. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. That is in Matthew chapter 7, verse 18. Lips and tongue that have never received the divine touch and linked and are linked to a unregenerate heart will definitely manifest traits peculiar to that nature. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. These traits identify the, car the, the carriers as men and women who have not received the gift of salvation and sanctification of the heart. These traits include the following. We run through a few. But at this point, let me say, remember the first we read in, in the book of James, can a tree bring forth this kind of fruit and that kind of fruit? Oranges and apples is not possible. Can a fountain bring forth sweet water and bitter? It's not possible. Even a sea, they'll say this water is salt water. They'll say this water is fresh water. But it's not possible for a, a, the water to be salt water and fresh water. What bodies of water are categorized. Seas and lakes are categorized. Salt water, fresh water. The type of fish you see in salt water is different from the type of fish you see in, in fresh water. So a choice has to be made. And God is calling us that today that we have to make that choice. You cannot, that inconsistency is not acceptable. You cannot, God is not going to take it. You have to make that choice to say, look, I am born again. I'm a child of God. Therefore, these things are not going to be in my vocabulary anymore. And where our tongue has been letting us down, saying things that we should not say, um, then we need to just come back to God today and make up our mind that my tongue is going to be consistent. If it's good, let it be consistently good. And if it is bad, let it be consistently bad. Now, let's open, let's look, run through a few references here. Now, when you say, when the Bible says tongue, it's, it's talking about words. So this category of a tongue, when it says a tongue that is like this, it's talking about words that are like that. Sometimes the Bible also says mouth as well. In James chapter 3, verse 5, we see a boastful tongue or boastful word. The tongue boasted great things. You say, is it this small object, this small organ in the body that is boasting all these things? I will do this, I will do that, I can do this, I can do that. A boastful tongue. Do you have a boastful tongue? You know, some people, they like puffing themselves up. And we're actually in a generation that likes puffing itself up. Everybody is a hero on social media. Everybody is a CEO. Everybody is like senior uh, employee. A boastful tongue. And you ask yourself, what is it about the tongue that just, just likes to feel big? You know, just likes to project itself as if it can do all. A boastful tongue. In some references, we also see a deceitful tongue. This one is serious. We have to, you know, we have to check it out. If your tongue is deceitful, and you ask yourself, why is my tongue deceitful? Well, 
could because of fear of man. The fear of man bringeth a snare. The fear of man sets a trap for us and deal with it at the root cause. That's what the Lord is telling us today. All these things we are learning, we have to deal with it at the root cause. If you say, well, all these things we are going to reach with, I'm just going to make up my mind, or bad words will not come out of my mouth. That is, that's not the root cause. The heart. Deal with the heart first. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mind speaks. If there's fear in the heart, fearful words will come out. If there's pride in the heart, boastful words are going to come out sooner or later. So, if there's suspicion in the heart, the same thing. So, deal with the heart first. Later, or after you've dealt with the heart, I'll tell you some other things that you can do. So, Psalm, uh, Psalm 52, verse 4. Thou lovest all devouring words, O, this, o thou deceitful tongue. O thou deceitful tongue, a tongue that can deceive. We have also have in, um, let's go to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs has a wealth of instruction from us. It's a book of wisdom. And as part of that wisdom, you know, there's the tongue is critical to that wisdom. It's not possible to be wise without really, or to be seeking wisdom without um, talking about the tongue. In Proverbs chapter, in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 23, he that rebuketh a man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flatter with the tongue. There's a flattering tongue. And we see it in churches. It's, it's common in Pentecostal. It's common in church. Uh, a flattering tongue. Just saying things. Oh, and it's not in your heart. It's not in, all those things are not in your heart. But, you know, flattering. Oh, that, uh, I appreciate you so much. Uh, your, your message is so nice. Yo, this is so nice about you guys, and it's not really sincere. A flattering tongue is not good. Don't let us not flatter with our tongue. If you don't have anything good to say about somebody, then don't say anything rather than flatter with our tongues. The Lord will deliver us from all flattery in Jesus' name. In Proverbs chapter 17, Proverbs chapter 17, I read verse 4. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 4. A wicked doer giveth heed to false lips, and a liar, a liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. That's Proverbs chapter 17, verse 4. A naughty tongue, an uncontrollable tongue. You know, when you say this child is naughty, not your child, but maybe you go out to you go out to the amusement uh, park or you go out to the church, uh, supermarket, and you see a child, you see the way that child is behaving, you know, uncontrollable, not listening to the parent, making a scene, and just naughty. You say, this child is naughty. I say, God, deliver. Thank you for not giving me a, this type of child to me. Same way the, the tongue can be naughty. You know, the tongue, just uncontrollable, you know, un unruly, just causing embarrassment, a naughty tongue. In Proverbs chapter 12, Proverbs chapter 12, verse... Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 18. There is, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. There is that speaker like the pierces of the tongue of, this, of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is held. There is a person, the people that speak and their words are like the piercing of a sword. Have you, can you relate to this? Have you ever come across somebody like this before? Do you know somebody like this? And when they are speaking, when they are and when they are when they are happy, oh, they are they are as sweet as sugar. But when they are unhappy, when you get that word, whether it is they speak it to you, or they type it up and they send it to you on the phone, it's like as if you have been pierced with a sword. And they do it deliberately. They they, 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 they they craft that message. They craft those words so that the words can pierce to maximum effect, can wound, can, you know. They, they know some of these people, if they are close to you, they they will not just say something generic. They will, they will, they will take it over. They will take it over. They will say, what am I going to say? They will pick something that has half truth in it. 
something they know that this one you cannot just throw it in the bin because this person has studied you, they know you, and they say something about you that you can relate to that is painful. There is he that speaketh like the pierces of the sword or the tongue of the wise prince. Which one are you? Are you the person that if somebody is wounded, your tongue will bring health? Or if you are, are you the person that if somebody is having a good day, just woke up and is singing, if they come across you, oh, that is the worst thing that can ever happen to them. Your word can pierce them on a day when you are not happy. You have other types of tongue. I, I will give them to you. You can write them down. You have mischievous tongues in, in Psalm 52, verse 2. You have proud tongue in Psalm 12, verse 3. You have scourging tongue in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 18. You have coursing tongue in Psalm 10, verse 7. You have Raging tongue in Hosea chapter 7, verse 10. Backbiting tongue in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 23. Let's read that one. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 23. Now, backbiting is not a word that everybody might be familiar with. It's not even a word that is common in vocabulary nowadays. Um, so people don't really know what it is. They have created new words for them. The young people, the youths, have created new words to describe this. But in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 23, the note wind driveth away rain. So does an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. This is counsel for you and it's for me. They think that people that have backbiting tongues, who is a backbiter? Somebody that cannot bite you in the front, cannot bite you, it will not stand before you to bite you, is biting from the back. It means somebody that doesn't have the courage or doesn't have the honesty to say certain things face to your, to your face, but when you are not there, can backbite. That means they can bite you in the back. And it's very common in our society. Now I've, uh, I've described it, you will see. In the offices, there are many of them like that. That when they are when 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 that person walks out, the person, you are in the same office. That person just goes out of the office. Oh, that person has become the topic of discussion, isn't it? And they'll say they'll tell you all the things that the person have done wrong, and all the secrets of that person. And when the person comes back, they are smiling again at that person, and I make you a cup of tea. Uh, the, the the person that you know when. When when the, the, when the this person that when this person asks, oh, can I contribute to the you know the, to the fund? Maybe you have a contribution that you use. You contribute together. You buy tea and coffee and biscuit. They'll say, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. When the person have left, they'll say, this person, oh, very stingy, very this and that. Always you know always wanted to take advantage. Eat it. if you bring cake in, they'll eat it with you. If you bring a biscuit, in, but they'll never buy anything. But you are the one who just said, don't worry. After you say, don't worry, then you are not backbiting at the back. But what is telling us in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 23 here is that don't allow these backbiters, don't give them chance. It says, as the north wind drive it away, rain. Rain wants to fall. There's a wind coming from the north. It blows away that rain. So when a backbiter wants to start their business, and they want you to lend your ear. It says, change your countenance. Change the expression on your face. There's an expression that you give. It's called an angry countenance. When the backbiter see it, they will leave you. They will not want to talk to you because they can see that you don't have interest in the thing that they're trying to tell you. I pray that the Lord will make us faithful and consistent in Jesus' name. We move on to point number two which is the traits of a good, blessing, attracting, and impacting tongue. Our tongues has, have the power to bring blessings on us. And our tongues also have the power to bring blessings on other people. Our, our tongues, with our tongues, we should make have a purpose in our heart that everybody that I want to come across, who's going to come across me in life, I want my I want to have a positive impact on that person through my tongue. 
He said, Pastor, is that, how is that possible? It's not by flattering everybody, make everybody happy. No, that's not what I'm talking about. That means that with our tongue, we are able to have positive impact on people. Doesn't mean that we praise them all the, all the time. Doesn't mean that uh, we never say anything negative. No, sometimes we can rebook. Sometimes we can tell them the bitter truth. But it just means that we, we have a purpose in our heart to start off with that with my tongue, I am going to be a blessing. Amen. And the Lord will make us a blessing in Jesus' name. But you see, that purpose is very important because from my observation, of some, a lot of the time, I would say, from my observation, the things that cause problems, the times when we cause problems with our tongue, it's not, it's not by purpose. Sometimes it's just carelessness, careless talk. When a Christian be careless with their tongue, this is not something, it's, it's out of purpose. You didn't do it in purpose, you did out of purpose. It's just that what the tongue is saying, okay, are we just, are we just going to keep quiet now? Shouldn't we say something? Uh, the tongue likes to talk. It's very a very active organ in the body. And so, sometimes the things you didn't plan to say. You didn't, when you woke up in the world, you didn't plan, when you were having your quiet time, you never planned that, I'll go out back, bite, I'll go out gossip, I'll go out say this one. But things that are unplanned are the things that sometimes cause problems when the tongue just takes over. But we can combat that also with purpose to say, look, rather than just think about the negative, I want to avoid saying bad with my tongue, I want to avoid this one. What are you proposing to do positive with your tongue? With your tongue, you can counsel. With your tongue, you can build up. With your tongue, you can preach. With your tongue, you can bring somebody back from the way of destruction. From your, with your tongue, you can open somebody's eyes to see where their life is going. So not just avoiding negative, but we can also do very positive good with our tongue. I remember everything we do positive with our tongue, we're going to receive a reward for it. Now, in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 7, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 7, or verse 6, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. So there are two scenarios uh, uh, described here. You have somebody that comes to you and is kissing you with their words, which means they, they make you feel good all the time. I have another person that comes occasionally and with their words, they wound you. Now the tendency is to run away from the one that is wounding you with the, with the, with the words and gravitate the one that is always flattering you and making you feel nice with the words. But it goes beyond that. Look at the personality of the person and the intention of the person. The one that is kissing you with their words is actually an enemy. It doesn't have anything good for you in mind. That's why they don't care if you're doing good or you're doing bad. They would, they, so people can flatter somebody to, to, to the point where the person will fall into hellfire. Faithful, so one is an enemy, but they're always kissing with their words. But when somebody is a friend, there are times when if, if a friend says that you are going in the way of destruction, or oh, a good friend, they will wound you with their words. They will, they will slap you with those words. They will wound you with those words. But this person is doing it out of faithfulness. It's not easy to rebook anybody, let me tell you. It's not easy with, to cope with all the fallback of having to correct. You correct somebody. It's not as if you're afraid of that person, but the relationship sours for a while. The person doesn't, is avoiding you for a while. The person might even go further as bad-mouthing you in all the different circles. Why? Because you rebook somebody. You say, this thing, my brother, will take you to hell. My sister, I'm not going to allow this thing in your life. You see, but it takes it takes courage to do that work. It takes the faithfulness of a friend to do those words. Parents who have ever had to stand against their children and rebook their children, they know what I'm talking about. Pastors as well. And you have these two categories of uh, churches, two categories of pastors. You have people that every time you go there, they're always kissing you with their words. And you like those places. You tune into the Broadcast, you love those because why wow, they always make me feel good. They are always encouraging. 
They always put a smile on my face. They always make me feel I can do everything. I can fly. I can conquer the world. Whereas I go to this other one, sometimes it's sweet. Sometimes it's bitter. Sometimes it will wound me. Sometimes the, the message will be hard that I will be crying. And the tendency is to run away from this one and gravitate towards the other one. But no, the one that is rebooking you is actually your friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the cases of an enemy are deceitful. Now, let's open our Bibles to Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 50 from verse 4. Isaiah chapter 50 from verse 4. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned that I may know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakened morning by morning. He wakened my ear to hear as the learned. These are traits that we're seeing. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned. And he can give each and every one of us the tongue of the learned. The tongue of the instructed. The tongue of the one that has been trained. The one who has been coached by God. The one who has gone through God's apprenticeship and God has told you this is how to use your tongue. God has given me the tongue of the learner that I should know how to speak a word in season to it that is weary. So when God brings someone that is weary, you know, when someone is about to just drop off and backslide and forget about Christianity, somebody that is discouraged because of the situation and problem, God has given me the tongue of the learner to know how to speak a word in season a word in season, a word for that moment to the one that is weary. My brethren, let's ask ourselves this question. If God brings somebody in my way who is about to, to just, this, they're, they're about to just drop off, they're about to, they're fed up, they're about to just leave church or even leave this world, and on the last encounter, what impact would I have on that person? Because, you see, for everyone that backslides, for everyone that doesn't backslide but leaves a church and just says, I'm not coming to church anymore, there's always a last encounter. There's always that one person that broke the camel's back. That said, I've been managing, I've been coping, but this one, I can't take it anymore. There's always that last one, the last straw that breaks the camel's back. And are you that person? And they'll say, this one, because of this last one, and because of what he said, what she said, this uh, this is finished now. But also, you could be the one who, that last encounter, the person that has already packed up their suitcase and said, I am going. That last encounter, when they get home, they unpack the suitcase because of the thing that you that you said to them. And sometimes you don't know. They haven't told you that I have packed my suitcase. I just came to say bye-bye. You don't know. But the thing you say could be very it could go a long way. I need to speak to my fellow preachers also because it says the Bible tells us the book of James, be not many masters, because we shall have the greater condemnation. Sometimes that last encounter is us. A people, somebody that is weary, somebody that is, you know, just crumbling under the load of the of the body. Maybe it's your sad description that is the last one. Or maybe it's your message that is the last, or your announcement that is the last one. Or choristers, maybe it's the last, the last, choose your songs carefully. Maybe that's the last song that might change the mind of that person. The person goes home to unpack their bag. Or it could be the one that even before the end of the service, the person will say, I'm not even going to wait till the end. I'll, 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 I'll take my flight even before that time. I pray that the Lord will use us. The Lord will give us discernment. The Lord will give us the tongue of the learned to know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary in Jesus' name. In the book of Proverbs chapter 15, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 4, Proverbs chapter 15, and verse 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach of the spirit. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. The words we say, when you when you hear tongue, remember its words. A wholesome tongue, wholesome words are a tree of life. So that means the words we say can go on producing, producing, or producing life. It doesn't end with that, just that first encounter. Similarly, the opposite also applies. Evil words. 
bad words. It doesn't end with just that one encounter. You say it, it's very easy to say something, but it's hard to recall those words. You realize it's hard to go back. In the moment of discouragement, you could have said something to somebody, and then other people are hearing in the background. You say, so for instance, you call up your sister and you are complaining. You don't know that the sister's children are hearing in the background. And the visitor that is there is here in the background. And then, but you just said all those things in a fit of discouragement. Life is not as bad as you said it. And that person you are complaining about is not as bad as you painted the person. Then later on, the Lord surprises you with a miracle. The Lord carves your soul. It's not, it's not possible to go back to every single person that I've had. Even if you go and do restitution to your sister, how about your sister's children? Who are just playing and watching their TV in the background, and they're forming an impression that, oh, is this how Christianity is? Is this how church, is this how marriage is? And those children grow up, maybe they are praying for them, everyone is praying, get married, get married. The child doesn't want to get married. Why? Because of the picture that you have painted. I pray that we will not um, do things that have far reaching effect on the lives of people in Jesus' name. So what are some of the traits? I'll list them for you. So I've already given you examples. Hannah, through her words, she, 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 got, she, she got a miracle. If she had answered the prophet Eli, according to the tone with which he had accused her, forget about it. You might say, well, you say, well, but she went to pray to God. Uh, the man of God is there. And the man of God says something. He, did, he got her wrong. He read her wrong. But she could have responded very harshly also. She could have said, and you call yourself a man of God. Do you, do you smell alcohol in, under my breath? Don't, aren't you supposed to have the discernment of the spirit? It's because of people like you that people don't come to temple anymore. And why are you talking like this? I found all the gossip about your own family as well. And she could have walked away in anger. Would that prophet have begged her? Would he, would he have uh, blessed her? No. But words are very important. Even when we're under pain, my brethren, words are very important. The tone with which we reply is very important to men of God, to our husbands, to our wife, to our boss in the work. And then also, Abigail. Abigail, death was coming, on riding on a horse towards our family. And she met death on the way with words, just with a woman meeting a warrior with words. A warrior that was armed to the teeth to destroy her husband. Words have a big power. So let's consider our words thoughtfully. Let's consider. Sometimes we just speak without thinking. We just say, when I open my mouth, the Holy Spirit will feel it. Yes, that's part of it. Sometimes we need training. We need to think through, what am I going to say? And not only what am I going to say, when am I going to say? The timing is very important sometimes. Sometimes some people just say, I will say it. Is the truth, I'll just say it. No, say the, the, everything has a timing. Speak the truth in love at the time when it's going to have the impact you need it to have. You'll say, well, I will say whether it will have the impact or not. God will know that I've said it. Then are you really concerned about that person? If you just want to say it so that your blood will not be in my hand, that is different. But if you want to say so that it will be received, because communication needs to be received in order to it, for it to be effective. If you are... We are standing on the rooftop and we're blasting with megaphone and nobody is hearing and nobody is receiving it. Is that, has that message been passed across? So the timing is very important. And then also we need to choose our battles carefully. If there are many issues that you need to raise, you don't have to raise all of them at once. Tell me how you feel. Okay, I'll tell you everything I feel. And 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, yesterday, and you mix everything together, there's no impact. But sometimes you just pick, what God, with the wisdom of God, you pick what you have to say at that moment. The other one, you can pick them later. Praise the Lord. So what are some of the traits? Well, a bridal tongue. You can write down Psalm 39 verse one, a bridal tongue, a tongue that, a, a bridal is a leash. You know, these. Uh, these dogs, they say, are going around attacking people. Some of the time, it's because they don't have leash. 
if they have leash and the holder is holding on to them, then they will not be able to go and tear other things apart. A bridal tongue. Put your tongue, put a leash on your tongue. Your tongue wants to be unruly. It wants to be naughty. It wants to be uncontrollable. It wants to say, you have controlled your feet. Okay. You've controlled your hands. Okay. You control your thoughts. Okay. Uh, but don't you know that I am the, the hardest to control? Your tongue just wants to be unruly. It wants to be without control, without leash. You bridle it. A wise tongue. We, we can write that Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. The tongue of the learned. A sanctified tongue. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 7. And a comforting tongue. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. A soft tongue. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 15. The Bible says a soft tongue can break bone. A soft tongue. You say, well, I don't have power, so I will use my words to express how unhappy I am. I cannot fight this person. I don't, it's bigger than me. It's every, but I'll use my words to at least release my emotion and everything. A soft tongue can break bone. You imagine, look at the tongue. It doesn't have bone in it. Look at bone, hard, soft tongue, a uh, tongue soft. But a tongue that you know, is wise and knows how to act can break bone. Can break bone. You can convince a hard person. You say, my husband is hard. A soft tongue can break bone. You say, well, in our church, it's like this, is like that. A soft tongue can break bone if you know the right time and you know the right words to use. Praise the Lord. We move on to the last point before we pray. Taming and mortifying an unruly tongue. We've read um, James already. James chapter 3, verse 8. James chapter 3, verse 8. You can write it down. And James chapter 1, verse 26. Let's look at James chapter 1, verse 26. How can we tame this tongue? Well, first of all, we need a change of heart. If you try to tame your tongue without change, a change of heart, it will not work. And so people are doing that. They waste their time because they, they, they still like, we've heard from our pastor, they study how people behave. They study the type of vocabulary, type of words people use in the power. And they just use those things. But the heart is not changed. One day it will come out. You do it in church. When you are home, it's different. When your children get on your nerves, the type of words that we never imagine are in your dictionary, everything begins to come out at once. Why? Because your heart has not been changed. So we need to, first of all, have a deep, we need to be saved. When you are saved, your words change. When you are sanctified, your words change further. When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, your words change even more. They change further than that. And then even when you are saved, sanctified, baptized in the Holy Spirit, you know that they're out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So in terms of discouragement, if there's an abundance of discouragement in your heart, when you open your mouth, it, your mouth it will want to flood out of your mouth. So you need to be able to control that. You see that you go to the source, you handle this, but while you're handling that discouragement, you put a bridle on your mouth so that it doesn't come out of your mouth. Because if it comes out, then it will discourage other people. And you're, it's like you're spreading the poison. So always check out what's in your heart before you open up your mouth. If there's faith in your heart, Faith will come out. If there's fear in your heart, fear is going to come out. So in James chapter 1, verse 26, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridled not his tongue, but deceived his own heart, is that man's religion is vain. It cannot be clearer than this. Anybody that cannot bridle his tongue, no matter, you can say I'm 20 years in deeper life, that man's religion is vain. I pray that our religion will not be vain in Jesus' name. And James chapter 3, verse um, 8. James chapter 3, verse 8. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. It's only God that can help you. By changing your heart, the Lord will change your words. So what are some of the things we need to do? Well, we need to bridle our tongue. We need to learn to tame our tongue. Your, our tongue wants to run, it wants to run, sprint marathon it wants to be all over the place you need to be able to learn to tame our tongue with god's help i cannot tame my tongue myself no man can tame their tongue 
but the Lord can tame my tongue. He can help me. He can teach me how to tame my tongue. Praise the Lord. Then in Proverbs chapter uh, 5, 15, verse 2, Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 2, as we round up, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 2, the tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools falleth for foolishness. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright. This a, 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 a this wisdom for us here. The tongue of the wise knows useth knowledge aright. What does it mean? There is knowledge. I know this. This is the, a secret of this person. This is a secret of the Lord. This is something I know about my husband, my wife, my child, my this one. You might say that. You know things about different people. This is my friend in the church. I know this about him. This my spouse that I've been married to. I know this one about it. These, my, these are my children. I know this one about them. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge are right. It's not everything you know you say. And watch out in the time of anger, in the time of uh, in the time of family argument. It's not everything you know that you say. It's not your, everything you know about your wife's secret or your husband's secret that you say when you are angry. I just say, well, he has hurt me. So let me say, I know this one. Your mother is like this. Your, your, your brother is like this. This is how you are born. You begin to say things out of that anger in your heart. Even in the time when you are not angry, the, the, the tongue of the wise uses knowledge are right. Fellow preachers, it's not everything you know that you use as illustration for people. The things you take one-on-one -on -one to people and you say, brother, this, you still put the Bible, you correct from the Bible. So that people will not say it's what he knows about me, that he's correctable. If you need to correct a single person, you don't have to correct a single person using the whole pulpit. If you need to correct the whole church, it's different. So if you need to correct a single person. So the tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright. Brother teaching sad the scripture, there's knowledge you have. It is not during the sad the scripture that knowledge should come out. The current affairs that happen in the church. It come out during it's not it shouldn't be or you are not the one teaching they say answer question instead of answering the question you veer off and the knowledge you have sometimes you want you ask something because you want to the, you want to use the pre, uh, the teacher's mouth to talk to your wife it shouldn't be the tongue of the wise uses knowledge right, let's not misuse the knowledge that the Lord has given to us but the mouth of fools or it out foolish if you open your mouth and you say everything you know. The Bible says you are a fool. The mouth of fools pour it out foolishness. We teach our children that, or don't we, that it's not everything they know they go and say outside the house. It's not everything they know about the, the family. They say outside. And likewise, we add up, we should take it on board. So, the sinner cannot tame his tongue. You must renounce your sinful career and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The believer has the responsibility to, 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 to subdue and motivate every unedifying use of his tongue. That's in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. There's some steps here. First, you must not be talkative because since in the multitude of words, they wanted no sin. It's a matter of maths and statistics and proportion. The more you say, the more likely there's going to be an exaggeration there or a falsehood, or an error, or a flattery, or a backbiting, or gossip. In the multitude of words, they want to say. Secondly, we must study to be quiet. The Bible tells us that, that we should study, we should learn, we should practice how to be quiet. You say, it's not in my nature. I'm an extrovert, I'm a talkative by, by nature. It doesn't mean you are a sinner. It, the, some of the best evangelists we've had in the world are people that have, have God has given them silver tongue. They know how to talk, but just know how to st just study to be quiet when you need to quiet so that you can control your words when you need to talk a lot. The Bible says of Peter after he had preached that sermon, the Bible says with many words he exhorted them. You know, with many words. Give, give your life to Christ. An evangelist in the evangelism field can use many words, but you know you can you need to study to be quiet. When you need to be quiet, you need to learn also how to be quiet. 
Number three, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile. Guile is deceit. Then, number four, submit. we must submit our heart to the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit as the tongue is linked to the heart. And number five, we must be filled with the Spirit of God. And number six, we must give our tongue to the propagation of the gospel. Now, in summary, I must say that our ultimate destiny, when we're going to end and our ultimate reward is going to be linked to the use of our tongue. Whether we use our tongue bad or good. If I'm going to get reward for saving for salvation of souls, it, I will use my tongue. If I'm going to get reward for encouraging people and bringing people back from the from the verge of dropping out of the kingdom of God, it's through the use of my tongue. If I'm going to get a reward through worshiping God and singing our praise, it's through the use of my tongue. Think about all the service we do for God. It's through the use of our tongue. I think about all the punishment that people are going to be punished about. A lot of it is through the tongue. I want us to take this to the Lord in prayer. And I want you to commit yourself into the hand of the Lord. How are you using your tongue? You can change. You can change. You can change. How have you been using your tongue? What are some of the things you've said? Do you want to repent of those things that you've said? We can come out of moods, please, and we can pray. Other things that you, you see that I'm the one who causes trouble. My child that is acting like this, I'm the one. Then you can make amends. You can say, God, I'm sorry. You can go to that child. Other things you say to your children in anger. I think discouraging words. Their parents, if you see what they say to their children when they're angry, and they feel that I want the best for this child. I want the best for this child. You are lazy. You are this one. You are that one. You are not like me. When I was your age, I used to be very obedient. I used to be very this. And the child is getting fed up of all this nagging, 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 nagging. Your words are the one driving your child out of the kingdom of God. You can't change. Please change. The children, they're using the children are discovering why it's because of the parents' lifestyle and their words. The inconsistency. My mom, oh, if you see her in church on Sunday, fantastic. If you see how she talks to my dad during the week, your words is what is driving your child out of the kingdom of God. Repent. Repent. Brother, your words to your wife, be careful. Don't say anything that it will be hard. It's, it's like an egg that break, that broke. It's hard to scoop it back into the shell. Let's be careful. It is that we say that are going to be hard to, to, to recover from. There are things that some people might say, you might buy many flour. Flour will not take away that thing you have said. You might buy chocolate. You might pay for a whole, you might even buy a car for your wife. You might say, I want, I will buy, what do you like? You want sports car? I will buy sports car. Why? To make amends. You want to go for holiday, I will take you to America. It will not take away the things that we have said. Let's be careful what we say. The one we have said in the past, the law will forgive. The one we are still saying, let's change, let's change, let's change, my brethren. Let's change. Let's determine to use um, our tongues all right. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, you are remind us again between a tongue and the life that through our tongues we can transform our life. We can get prosperity by changing our tongue. We can get peace by changing our words. We can get progress through changing our words. We can get a power through changing our words. And then you have also reminded us that in order for our tongue to change, our hearts need to change also. We have committed everything that we've learned into your heart. And Lord, we pray that you make it profitable for us in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. And the hour of discouragement, in the hour when the tongue just wants to go and talk, in the hour of fear, in the hour of despair, in the hour, Lord, when we just feel pain, will help us to watch more carefully in those times than before in Jesus' name.
We thank you because believe it, Lord, in Jesus' 